Chapter 9 of the e-novel, Survival Novel, When the Walls Came Tumbling Down, as read by the author. Copyright Notice. You are free to copy and download this work in audio format for replay in any audio or video mode, and I encourage you to do so and enjoy and learn. You may redistribute it in a non-commercial fashion, that is, not for profit directly or indirectly. You may not sell or seek to profit from this publication in part or in whole, nor may you translate it into any written format for any purpose. Okay, thank you. Chapter 9, Predators. The hunting posse had taken on an unusual dynamic. It wasn't growing in number, but it wasn't really diminishing either. The idea to occupy farms was working pretty good, so long as they stayed away from the big commercial farms like the one they were currently in. They had taken it over easily enough, but found the old man and his wife had nothing in the potato silos and little in the pantry. They had sent them packing. Greg and his bunch looked savage and nasty that day, and the couple had walked off in the deep snow, tottering along with nothing but the clothes on their back and their jackets. Greg had thought of just shooting them, but had noted that sort of thing was alienating members of the group, and he would need the ones he had left. Although there wasn't much food, the farm did have a lot of fuel for the tractors and equipment. There was even an above-ground tank with some gas and a big propane unit behind the house that kept it warm and also helped run a small generator. The old man was definitely set for winter, that much was certain. In the barn, they found several tractors, a large potato shaker truck, a snowmobile, and a big diesel 4x4. Because of the fuel and the generator, Greg had decided to move in himself. The others came along, and he didn't discourage it. He needed someone to do the work, after all. Plus, there was safety in numbers. He brought the little Amish girl along as well, although he was getting tired of her. Time to trade her in on a newer model, he chuckled. While she was sweet, he preferred a trashy woman. They didn't seem to cry as much. They had encountered other people when they were scouting and scavenging. At first, it was easy to pick them off. Some of them even waved and came right over like sheep. Greg was amazed at how many people actually seemed to be waiting to be rescued, like everybody that came along might be the cavalry. He would wave friendly at them, and they would walk his way. When they got about 200 yards, he would shoot them with a single shot from his hunting rifle and watch them topple over. He liked the way they got that surprised look in their eyes for a second when they registered he was aiming a rifle at them. About the time they thought to move or duck or grab for their rifle, they were already shot. Sometimes they had a good weapon on them, maybe a knife or a nice watch, a wedding ring, but never any food. Most looked gaunt and hungry, too. Lately, though, most people knew to avoid strangers and did so. Greg mused that if you saw someone at a distance, it was best to just go wide of them. Maybe even the other way, because you never knew what kind of people you might meet up with these days. People like himself, for instance. Definitely too late for the man up ahead, thought Greg, chuckling as he scoped in on a burly man who sat astride a snowmobile about half a mile distant. The man could see Greg as well, and his four companions, and he was looking at them through a pair of binos. He casually let them hang down around his neck and then slowly held up his hand to wave. He didn't seem afraid, which kind of threw Greg for a moment. Greg had just made a huge mistake. He didn't realize he was looking at a fellow predator and not just another sheep. Pack Mule. Kevin was whipped and he knew it. He had sweated through his clothing despite knowing better, and now as he trudged wearily in his snowshoes, breath coming ragged, lungs raw, he saw the steam came off his shirt constantly. He had stripped off the parka and thick trousers only after he had sweated right through his clothing. He had been smart enough to wear moisture-wicking base layers, but they were saturated too, just like the outer shell. He knew he would have to stop soon. He was getting cold and tired. He also remembered that he was burning calories at an alarming rate this way. More demoralizing than this was the knowledge that he had barely come five miles in eight hours. His pace was a crawl with all this gear. His bug out bag weighed nearly 90 pounds alone and that was without ammo or weapon. That did not include the other items he had brought like large binos, the radio, and the cooking utensils. Now the decision to cache as much as he could live without was as easy as it was obvious. He wished, though, that he had done this before setting out. 
Kevin remembered the lesson from his survival books that when surviving or bugging out, you had to balance the cost to gain ratio. If you spend 200 calories to get only 100 calories of food, you would lose. Pulling all this extra gear had cost him an additional day's worth of food today, and tomorrow it would take even more. At this rate, he would be out of food before he even got halfway to Presk. He would have to cache or he would die in the snow. Halting for a moment to catch his breath, he noted the clouds were dropping lower. Snow would come again. Looking back over his shoulder, what he saw alarmed him. The ruts, the tracks, were so deep that they could be seen for a tremendous distance. Unless it was a blizzard tonight, those deep tracks would remain for long. Worse, they told anyone that he had something, and with people so desperate, they would probably shoot and hope it was food or something they needed. He was making himself a huge target for someone. He could not just find a campsite and flop down in his sleeping bag as much as he wanted and needed that, therefore. He would have to do something before he bedded down. He had to think of something. He had tried to move through the trees, but the snowbanks there were unevenly packed. This made the sled topple over on more than one occasion. Each time it had taken tremendous effort to stand it back up. He was forced instead to move in the open, to follow trails and roads too. Earlier he had noted some partially obliterated snowmobile tracks and this scared him a little because he knew now just how vulnerable he was, just how real the presence of danger was around him. He cringed a little and began to wonder if someone was watching, perhaps ready to shoot him at this very moment. This was not smart. He would have to fix it. Standing on the edge of a meadow, cold wind seeming to blow right through him, he knew he had to stop very soon now. He had an idea, something he had read in a book about tracking once. Now, with resolve, he headed straight across the meadow, tugging the sled behind him, each step strengthening his decision to lighten the load as much as possible, down to less than 60 pounds perhaps, something he could carry on his back alone. Reaching the tree line on the opposite side, he veered left 90 degrees and went several hundred yards, then parked his sled under the sprawling branches of a large fir tree. With his field knife, he slashed a big, bushy limb off from the inside and went back where he had made the turn, wiping his tracks clean, noting how easily he moved without the crushing burden of towing the sled. With any luck, someone tracking him would lose the trail completely. If they were good, though, they would immediately stop and begin walking concentrically larger circles until they found the trail again. This activity, this noise and commotion would give him the opportunity to escape, but he would also have to abandon his gear. Returning to the sled, shivering now, he decided to set up camp under the tree. There was a patch where there was no snow and he would sleep there. Hands shaking, he pulled his sleeping mat free from the outside, rolled it out, then got the sleeping bag out from inside the ruck, pulled off his boots and crawled inside, quickly, nearly frozen now, hands numb. Inside the sleeping bag, he pulled off his clothes and put them between the sleeping bag and the Gore-Tex bivy outer cover. His boots and his rifle went there as well. This would allow the heat of his body to push moisture out of the Gore-Tex and partially dry the sweat from them. Reaching again inside the ruck, he got out a dry sack with his change of clothing in it. Inside there, he had a set of dry silk weights and some fresh, heavy wool socks. They felt awesome on his tired feet. Shivering, he pulled a protein bar out and munched on it, noting that it was nearly frozen as well. Tomorrow, he would dress better, dress lighter, and not work up a sweat for one thing. Tomorrow, maybe, the sun would shine and it would be warm. He noted that he could clearly see his tracks across the meadow and wondered if this was a foolish thing to do. He knew he shouldn't fall asleep, but could not fight it off. He was exhausted. He fell asleep almost before he finished the thought. Random. The Humvees rolled up into the farmyard and spread out into a sort of semicircle creating a perimeter as the turret gunners swiveled out to cover their sectors. The ox's vehicle nosed straight in at the house, and he dismounted along with several soldiers from other vehicles. 
The farmer, a middle-aged man and his wife and daughter, came out to greet them. Living near the base, they knew about soldiers, and so they came out with smiles, waving. Had they known what was coming, though, that the men in the vehicles had gone rogue, they would have run for their lives. But years of living near the base, they had never had any trouble. In fact, the soldiers were mostly well-behaved, except maybe when they'd been drinking. The man went over with his hand out, therefore, smiling, and walked up to the one who was wearing all the stripes and appeared to be in charge. The ox shook his hand, but not in a friendly way. The farmer saw that several of the men, including the one who appeared to be in charge, were also leering at his wife and daughter. His temper got the better of him, and he asked gruffly, head held high, challenging, Can I help you, sergeant? Ox recognized a challenge. He also recognized a fighter. This old man would not bow his head. He had shown all the signs of it. He had seen it in prison before, too. It's first sergeant to you, and we have orders to search your house, the ox lied. In fact, they were not ordered to do anything of the sort. This farm had been picked quite at random. He cut a hard stare into the man's eyes, which did not dissipate the farmer one bit. Also, we have to see if you have any weapons. The man's eyebrows went up at this, but before he could finish, the ox lied and stated sarcastically, Don't worry, we aren't going to take them from you, and added, We've been ordered to inventory, that's all. In fact, Ox had used this ploy as a way of disarming the victims so they were easier to rob and do other things, too. Ox looked past the man and his wife again. She was certainly a sharp-looking woman. So was his daughter. Both were easy on the eyes. The old man bristled at this. He had taken enough off this man. He would report him to his superiors. He knew that the military had very strict rules about the military dealing with civilians. This man would be lucky to hang on to his stripes. Before the collapse, this would have been true, but not now. Now there was no control. The patrol moved quietly through the hardening snow. The temperatures were not so cold during the day, and the sun was making it melt a bit now. This made for easier going, especially off the beaten trails where patches of earth were starting to show through again. Soon these trails were turned to mud. I knew that General Winter was as formidable a foe as his counterpart, General Mud. A smart leader, therefore, wouldn't waste personnel, resources, or time fighting either. Right now, General Winter was working with us, for us somewhat. Every day we lived in our comfortable and warm homes was a day the marauders were having to either hole up somewhere or were possibly even dying. Every day we grew stronger, and every day they grew weaker. I thought how history often repeats itself. We were a sort of feudal community now, organized to defend ourselves against marauding bands. I mused how our ancestors, the Vikings, were the marauders, and now things were turned around for this community. We were a civilization defending itself from the barbarian hordes, like ancient Rome, perhaps. Indeed, all of society was going through a sort of evolution at the moment, a purging in some areas, but also a restructuring. When a civilization is no longer able to sustain its economic and political systems, it fails. During this time, as people sought to survive, always come those who want to rule over others for a variety of reasons. Out of necessity, people form into groups, which begin small and then grow in size for the basic needs of defense from other groups. The notion that people will automatically be good and act civilized was as flawed as it was persistent in some people's minds. Sadly, these utopianists were probably dead now, killed by someone who didn't share their opinions on the inherent goodness of man. The equinox of the sun told me that spring would soon be here, and with it would come big trouble. I knew from history that when life got down to a sort of tribal or feudal level, it was always this way, as people fought each other over the limited and often dwindling resources. Food, or the ability to grow food, would come first and foremost. It would be this way for us all for some time to come. Before the infrastructure, we took it all for granted. Now, we would see how hard it was, especially without machinery or even horses to grow, for most of us at least. Too many people had failed to plan, and many who did plan had done so inadequately. I wondered if I was one. Those who did have food and also the ability to defend it from the stood the greatest chance of surviving this first year. 
a man who could do this and knew how to produce his own food, had the tools, materials, and technology, would think himself a king. So many little things that were done before would pay for themselves a hundred times over now. That can of seeds, those books, all that practice. I thank God for opening my mind so many decades ago, for changing the desires of my heart, for drawing me back to the land. In those moments in my life when I was closest to the land, there was little fear or concern. A full pantry and the ability to grow more food was like a fortress in my mind, for nothing gave me greater security and peace than to stand in the middle of a field of crops that I had planted with my labor. No greater evidence that God would provide and do so abundantly. God had done so for me in the past. Now I prayed He would do so for all those whom He had placed in my life, not just those under the corners of my roof, but indeed for this little town. This was my reasonable service to God. I knew that these hard times were not something God did capriciously. They were done with a purpose. I noted that people were turning more to the Lord for help lately. When we were all well-fed and content, and our security was in our bank accounts and jobs, how quickly we had forgotten him. My mind went back to the task at hand as Paul called a halt. He was leading today's patrol, and I was going along to evaluate and to assess. I liked what I saw. At 28 years of age, he was a battle-proven, effective combat leader, a rarity and a treasure to us, I realized, as good as any officers I had ever once trained. He was sharp, articulate, and above all, understood that as a leader, respect is earned. It is first given to your men before you can even dream of expecting it in return. He would do fine, and I was grateful that his example was being emulated by the others. With good leaders of the patrols, I could focus my efforts not on leading them, but on developing the leaders of these patrols, of teaching them the things they would need to survive, to win, and to overcome. Each man on this patrol had either a large hand-painted sign on his back or a couple of engineering stakes. I had the post driver for the stakes and another man had a wrench to bolt them on. Steve was back at the farm. Now with the snow melting, soon maple syrup in full flow, we were aiming to get every ounce we could this year. I knew that the raiders were essentially just criminals. In pre-lights out, the police did their best to keep the criminals at bay, but could not be possibly at all places at all times. Because of this, and as a deterrent, they varied their patrols and tried to be unpredictable. Businesses and homes used alarm systems. It was not the act of catching criminals alone that stopped them. It was the threat or possibility of getting caught that deterred the most crime. Bad men become bold when there is no punishment or consequence for their evil actions. The raiders were ruthless, this much we all knew. They would simply laugh at a sign that said, Posted, keep out, as if asking. I had a better idea. Our sign stated the same thing in different ways with deliberately hand-scrawled lettering. Essentially, this, anyone caught in this area, armed, will be shot on sight without warning. At the town meeting, we had announced clearly that we would not simply be gunning down anyone with a weapon, but rather anyone who was part of an armed party and who was not from this township. Since the town was small, it would be easy to identify who was from the area. As an added protection, people were encouraged to wear a blue armband on either arm. If we detected that the raiders were doing this, we would announce a color change at a town hall meeting. Still, though, we mostly knew each other and were getting closer knit every day. Rabbit. Jim toppled to the ground right next to Gray's idling snowmobile, making a gurgling sound just as the report of the rifle hit them. Caught off guard for a moment, not sure where the shot had come from, they didn't have long to wait before it became obvious. A ragged volley of fire that quickly intensified erupted, taking down another of the group. Greg could feel as much as hear the rounds clipping past him. Close, way too close. Almost instinctively, they all gunned their snowmobiles and took off in the opposite direction, weaving wildly over the snow. J.J. got hit just as he was turning, Greg noted, and fell from his machine. Brian was running neck and neck with Greg now when he suddenly lurched forward over the handlebars of his snowmobile, still managing to hang on. 
The three of them now running wild like the wind, engines at full throttle, machines moving as fast as their riders could make them go. Looking back over his shoulder, Greg could see he was now followed by Brian with Noel trailing in the rear. They were all still within range of the shooters, though, and bullets whipped around them with an intensity of fire that frightened Greg. Noel suddenly tipped out of his seat and into the snow, his snowmobile lurching to a stop, the dead man's safety switch shutting the engine off as soon as the rider's body left the seat. The shooters were now chasing after them, firing wildly and inaccurately from their snowmobiles. He had no way of knowing how many there were, but guessed perhaps half a dozen or more. His first instinct was to run straight back to the farm, but he knew they would only give away their location with this move, give it away to these pursuers. He didn't care about the other people there, but knew that the fuel bunker with several hundred gallons of gas was priceless to him. He didn't want to lose that. It was going to be needed for his plan. They would need it also to keep getting food. Brian was apparently wounded pretty bad because he started to lean onto the dash of the snowmobile, but still kept up with Greg, who was running his machine all out. They had nearly full tanks of fuel before they left, and so he led the pursuers on a wild chase, hoping they had less fuel. It was a gamble, but the only chance he had. In order to get a clean shot, they would have to dismount, so he made sure to stay clear of wide open spaces. They could chase all they wanted, but would never get a chance to close the distance, not on Greg and Brian, who had grown up in this area riding snowmobiles, who knew all the paths and trails. These guys might know too, but it was an even bet they didn't. After nearly 20 minutes of chase and being shot at intermittently, wildly, Greg stopped and got out his rifle and looked back down the trail but could see nothing. Satisfied, he headed back to the farm. Those guys had shot three of his party, not that he cared or would miss them, but they were good and sneaky, too. They had used the one guy on the trail as bait as a distraction, while the others had slipped up in the woods to flank them, staying downwind so the sound of their machines wouldn't carry. Greg had to admire their skill and cunning, and for the first time, he became a little afraid. Greg was down to a dozen people now. Nearly that many had left over the first raping. They did it quiet, too, without a big show, but he knew why. He had seen it in their eyes right afterward. Good riddance. They had gone along with it when it was happening, when they, what they called mob mentality was kicking in. Now, though, it was obvious that they weren't really with him. In life, people would jump on the bandwagon with you, but when the pep rally was over and the team lost, you found out who the real fans were. Greg would need more people, but how would he get them? Mouse. David woke up to the smell of coffee, and for a moment he was a little disoriented. It must be Linda. He wasn't used to having someone do things around the house, and he worked to resist the natural inclination of feeling put upon by someone, especially after what he knew she had been through. He took a moment to compose himself as he dressed and went downstairs. Coffee's ready. Biscuits, too. She looked so at home there in the kitchen, and he had to admit it smelled good. He had decided last night during prayers that he would ask her to stay on, that he needed to let her know she was invited. He knew this was on her mind, the way she avoided looking him in the eyes. She gestured to the table, and he sat. She sat down opposite him and bowed her head. He felt awkward because it was obvious she hadn't been so comfortable with him praying over the food the first time, so he kept it short today. God knew he was grateful. The biscuits were delicious. He could hardly tell they weren't from scratch, but from a box. The coffee was good, too. Linda, he began, I'm all by myself here, and it's very dangerous. I need you to stay. He didn't like mincing words when something needed to be said, and she stopped for a moment, looking at her plate, and then nodded without looking back, and said, okay. He had expected a little more than that, but then thought of how she must be feeling right now. Great then, I have so many things to tell you, he elaborated on the plans for the newspaper, for how to barter for copies, and how he hoped to set it in the garden. Can you garden, Linda? He asked earnestly, to which she eagerly nodded and added, absolutely. I know how to grow things, all kinds of things, how to raise chickens, too. We were going to put in a big garden behind our house, and uh, her voice trailed off as he, she looked away to the side, covering her face with her hand before she stood up abruptly and said, Excuse me, I have to go, and ran up the stairs to her room. 
David's worst fears were confirmed. Her husband had been murdered. He saw the mark where the ring had been, which meant the ring must have been stolen and possibly worse. He heard enough stories of that over the radio. Later, she had come down the stairs, and it was no less awkward than before as David started to apologize, and she held up her hand and said, It's not your fault. David quickly responded and said, It's not yours either, Linda. You're a victim. She looked at him curiously, but did not nod. Your rifle is cleaned and sitting in the living room against the wall, he said. He knew they had other things to talk about, not the least of which would be their relationship. It wasn't every day that a woman moved into a strange man's house, after all, and she must be more than a little nervous as to his intentions. Linda, I'm an old man, and I have a daughter your age. She may be coming up this way, but I fear the worse. If she makes it, then we'll have an even greater chance of surviving all of this. He threw in the last part because it was true, as it was important for her to know. He wanted her to know that the welcome mat was not temporary and not on a whim. If he put it on the terms that she was actually an asset and not a burden, she would settle in quicker, not feel so awkward. The healing would start. David knew what it was like to be a guest and wanted her to feel permanent and welcome. She smiled at him and said, Thank you, David, thank you. A little tear in her eyes. He smiled at her and said, Come on, let me show you where everything is. You help yourself to anything you need. As he led her to the radio room, he could sense his wife smiling in approval and saying, Good for you, David. You take care of that little girl. Yes, dear, he said quietly out loud, and Linda said, I'm sorry, did you say something? David smiled and said, Yes, I did, but it's okay. <laughs> Linda smiled and thought about how much like her grandpa he was, always saying the strangest things. This has been Chapter 9 of the e-novel, survival novel, Prepper novel, The Walls Came Tumbling Down, as read by the author. Chapter 10 will be published, Lord willing, next week on Friday. Thank you for tuning in, folks. It's good to have you over. Look forward to seeing you back. Goodbye.